Hey guys, welcome back to the introductory chemistry lecture two. Last time we talked about the atom and how we borrow the term atom from Democritus, the ancient Greek philosopher. And, uh, you know, Democritus' idea was that the atoms were indivisible, but of course that's not true. We, we can divide the atoms into their subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it also, also alluded to the fact that there are fundamental particles. That's right. I can break apart a proton. Um, today we're going to talk about the, the library of atoms that we find in the periodic table. So there's 92 naturally occurring, occurring elements here on planet Earth. And there are some laboratory-made elements as well. And, um, and of course... Um, Understanding their elemental properties is the uh, basis for chemistry. Here's a table of those elements called the periodic table, and uh, and uh, they help organize those elements in, based on their properties. And, and actually, more than anything, their, their electron configuration, which hopefully by the end of today's lecture, you'll have an idea or an appreciation for. Well, <clears throat> if I look at the periodic table, I see a, like I said, a library of the 92 naturally occurring elements. And uh, for each element, I, I get some information about it. And so uh, the most common element on the, in the universe is hydrogen. And uh, at the top of um, our symbol here, we have it, the chemical name. H is the chemical symbol for hydrogen. H for hydrogen. C for carbon. It's not always a straightforward, right? Sodium, the letter is Na. Uh, titanium, it's W. So it's not always straightforward, but anyway. Chemical name, chemical symbol, usually closely related. This number is really important. This is called the atomic number. And this is its identity. And this is the number of protons found in that element. If you have one proton, your hydrogen. If you have six protons, your carbon, et cetera, et cetera. At the bottom, we have something called the atomic weight, or atomic mass, or gram molar equivalency. It sort of varies based on the table that you're looking at, and that's kind of complicated. But in general, it's the mass of the atoms, neutrons and protons and electrons, added up in terms of atomic mass units divided by their distribution in the universe. It's kind of a complicated thing, but it, um, the uh, if it's a whole number, it just reflects their t the number of protons and neutrons. So, um, and if it's, um, <clears throat> you can also use this number to, to uh, work with the materials in the lab. And that, that means this, um, if I have 1.00794 grams of hydrogen, I have what's called a mole of hydrogen. If I have 12 grams of carbon, I have a mole of carbon. Um, that brings up a, one of those fundamental confusing parts of chemistry. What's a mole? Well, it's not that little thing with the star-shaped nostrils down in the ground. It's um, sometimes called, the chemist does it. It's also called Avogadro's number. And when you go take chemistry class, you can spend a lot of time figuring it out. Anyway, it's 6 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And uh, that's a large number. So, <clears throat> elements uh, like hydrogen and carbon and nitrogen all have this identity of the number of protons. And in the smaller elements, the lighter elements of the table, the proton number and neutron number and electron number generally are equal or close to equal. But as we move through the table, Proton number and neutron number are not the same. So, for instance, hydrogen has atomic number one. It's got one proton. Carbon atomic number six has six protons, six neutrons, six electrons, typically. Nitrogen atomic number seven has seven protons and seven neutrons. And one of the classic test questions is, how do you tell how many neutrons are in nitrogen? Well, I know I've got seven protons here. I know the atomic mass is 14, so if I take 7 from 14, I'm left with 7. That means that nitrogen has 7 protons and 7 neutrons. Okay, oxygen, 
Atomic number eight, eight protons. Atomic number 16, so it must have another eight neutrons for atomic mass of 16. Now, phosphorus here, this number is really close to 31. In fact, its atomic mass would be 31. Its atomic number is 15, so it's got 15 protons and how many neutrons? How about potassium? 19 protons on atomic mass of 40, rounded up. All right, 39. And uh, so atomic number and atomic mass um, tell us a little bit about each one. And more importantly, the truth is that there are multiple flavors of carbon. So there's isotopes, isotopes of carbon, isotopes of hydrogen, isotopes of oxygen. In fact, probably isotopes of all the elements. I just don't know much about it. I'm not, a, I'm not an inorganic chemist. So for instance, hydrogen always has one proton. But a hydrogen whose atomic mass is two, and you'll note here that hydrogen's atomic number is one, its atomic mass is one. Well, what does that mean? If it's got one proton and its mass is one, does it have any neutrons? No, typically hydrogen doesn't. But anyway, hydrogen one is the most common form, and that's simply a lone proton. That's what most hydrogen in the universe exists at. But there is something called hydrogen two. We also call it deuterium. And it has one proton and one neutron, so its atomic mass is close to two. It's an isotope, and it's less stable than H1. There's another hydrogen isotope called tritium. Two, one proton, two neutrons. Also, another isotope, radioactive isotope, undergoes rapid decay. Oxygen has other isotopes. The typical, most stable form of oxygen is oxy uh, oxygen 16, but there's also oxygen 17 and 18. And in biochemistry, a lot of times we'll actually look at these isotopes of carbon. Typically, carbon is found as carbon-12, six protons, six neutrons. But, and I've got an error here on my table, this should be easier. There's also a carbon-14, and carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. Anyway, those other isotopes of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and lead and plutonium and you name it, they got isotopes, are less stable than the common form. And that means they undergo radioactive decay. And in radioactive decay, I have this atom of plutonium that actually gives off a particle, gives off a neutron, and then it becomes uranium. Um, and there's a couple different types of radioactive decay, but uh, with varying levels of danger to, to living things, but um, that's not our topic. That's, that's chemistry. Well, atoms like to join with other atoms to form molecules and or compounds. So molecule has a very specific definition. A molecule is a particle formed by two or more atoms chemically combined via a covalent bond. I'm going to tell you what a covalent bond is in a minute. But H2, two atoms. And we symbolize it with this little subletter here. O2, it's two O's joined together, molecule, and they have a covalent bond. N2, two nitrogens joined by covalent bond. C6H12O6, that's glucose, multiple atoms joined by multiple covalent bonds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all molecules, okay? Some of these are also molecular compounds, right? So a compound is a particle formed when two or more atoms of different types join together, right? So molecular compounds are formed when I have two or more atoms of different types joined by covalent bonds. So H2 is a molecule, but it's not a molecular compound because it's just hydrogen joined to hydrogen. However, glucose is a molecular compound. Water, two hydrogen joined to an oxygen is a compound. It's a molecular compound. They're joined by covalent bonds. How do I know if it's a covalent bond? Well, you just got to know. And these are contrasted with ionic compounds. So ionic compounds are compounds that are made up of two more atoms that are joined by ionic bonds. And these are classically things like salts, like NaCl, acids like hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide or base, or calcium phosphate, etc. And we'll learn all about those in a very superficial manner, briefly. Okay. Chemicals, 
Atoms form bonds for two reasons. One is the octet rule. And the octet rule says that atoms tend to combine with each other so that their outer shell, or aka valence shell, will be filled. What does this mean? Well, you can see up here I've got when I begin, two hydrogen atoms, each with one lone electron, and they come together to share electrons. Now, neither, the one, neither of these hydrogen atoms is happy individually because they only have one electron in that outer shell, and that outer shell likes to be filled with two electrons. But when they share electrons, now each one more or less has two electrons in its outer shell. That's the basis for a covalent bond. All right, so the octet rule says that atoms want to have that outer shell filled, and when it is, they're happy. If it isn't, they're unhappy. There is also another trend to the periodic table called electronegativity that that drives, um, or it, it's a, a description of how well an atom is able to hold its electrons. And we'll talk about that in a second. So anyway, so the octet rule, atoms want to have their outermost shell filled. Here's lead, right? And you can see it's got one, two, three electrons, four electrons in its outer shell. Do you think it's happy? And the answer is no, lead likes to make chemical bonds. It likes to share electrons. Um, and of course, these different shells all have names. The first shell is called 1s. The first shell is called 2s. The third shell is 2p. And you can see that 1s has two electrons. 2s has two, two electrons. 2p has six electrons. The second orbital shell combines. So the first orbital shell is filled with two electrons. Second orbital shell is filled with eight electrons. I know it looks complicated. Just hang on. So anyway, suffice it to say, the shell, the electrons that are out in this outermost shell are called valence electrons. So covalent bonds are bonds born, bond, born out of sharing electrons in the valence shell. So hydrogen, atomic number one, has one proton, has one electron in its outermost shell. And so uh, it has a tendency to form a covalent bond. There's H2. Oxygen has 